everybody, and welcome back to the Consummate Athlete Podcast. I'm Molly Herford. I write about all things outdoors and athletic related. I co-host this podcast, and I do pretty much everything outdoors related, although not so much lately because everywhere I go, the weather seems to suck. And I'm Peter Glassford. I'm a registered kinesiologist and endurance coach. I work mostly with cyclists. Most of them are masters aged. Uh, but these last couple weeks, I have been spending time with 14 to 17 year old uh, young men and women who are pursuing the cycling discipline. So it's been both tiring and fatiguing on all levels for me, <laughs> mental and physical. Um, but also really, uh, I guess, motivational. You know, there's a lot of energy and excitement and just, you know, seeing people learning stuff and s stuff being new, right? Stuff that as someone who's relatively experienced in cycling, you know, seeing just what you take for granted being like a game changer for one of these young athletes is, is pretty awesome and makes all the stress and <laughs> the 14 to 17 year old antics that go along with that age, I guess. So mm -hmm. anyhow, I am fatigued. <laughs> yeah, you just got back from North Carolina yesterday. So fair enough. I'm actually down in New Jersey. I drove overnight after yoga teacher training on Sunday. Uh, teacher training has been going awesome. Um, but I have to say it's it's kind of exhausting. It's a lot of time in a classroom. Um, but it's really cool. And I will also add that 13 to 17 or 14 to 17 year old cyclists still just boggle my mind because at that age I didn't even know that bike racing was a thing that existed like literally really just thought the Tour de France was the only bike race in the world um, despite the fact that my dad raced triathlon and actually today's guest Nicole Lower is act is super similar to me in that she was not an active or overly active kid she ran um, from a young age, but definitely wasn't, you know, trying to go pro in anything, unlike some of the kids that you, you know, were dealing with the past couple weeks. Um, yeah, we chat about triathlon, we chat about the consummate athlete lifestyle. I think she's a really good example of it. She's uh, mid-20s, living in New York City, and, you know, while a lot of people find it really easy to be pretty unhealthy in New York City, especially working a normal nine to five like she is. And she is an adjunct professor at NYU teaching some classes. So you'd think she has a crazy schedule, but she still gets up at, you know, 430 every morning to hit the gym for strength training and gets in her endurance work and yeah, races triathlon in the summer. Yeah. I mean, I think this is something that applies to most of us, right? You know, you're sort of, I was pondering this this morning, actually, as I was, I was composing a tweet, I'm trying to remember, there's a lyric, a rap lyric about figuring okay. out what, figuring out what you're Twittering, but uh, I'll leave that to the rap specialists. Um, <laughs> Where are you going with this? Uh, I don't know, you might call them rappers, I call them rap specialists, they have specialized in that I, performance I meant where domain. are you going with the tweeting thing, not where <laughs> are you going with the rap thing. Um, I was going uh, that, you know, there's sort of this 14 to 17 year old age group where, you know, it is tempting to specialize, right? And um, a lot of the push right now is to not have specialized athletes, right, to have that multi-sport model and then at some point you specialize you know when when that glimmer of hope that you're going to become an olympian and you're you're on what we call the curve you know the performance curve uh, then maybe there's an argument to you know really specialize in on that that cycling or whatever the sport is but then sort of once you come off that curve and you become a, a masters and age grouper you know uh you get a job other than cycling then i i think that's where this consummate athlete idea where both you and I ha are excited about this and I have lots of master's age clients that you know we're applying this to I think with great success is you do need to have that sort of more balanced approach to sport and to life right so you're going to work but then you're also having to combat the fact that you're sitting at work or you know you're have a really maybe your job's really hard and you're landscaping or something right and so now we're dealing with all these different movement and lack of movement challenges and then we're also having you know an aging body uh, and we're also having to maintain different movement skills. So things like throwing or squatting or crawling are, are pretty much lost in most people, right? And so that's, you know, we talk about this a ton on the podcast with different guests. Um, but I think what I, I guess what my point in all of this is, is that really long you know, tweet. these younger, yeah, I know it's, it's a draft right now. Uh, but 
with these younger athletes and then also when we're on the other side of this curve, um, these more masters age group athletes is, you know, we have to find a way to maintain and, and preserve and improve these movement skills, right? So these other sports. And so what I like about triathlon, we did this big experiment last year where we did Ironman, was that it really lends itself to these, you know, multiple movement periods throughout the day. You know, you're doing double and triple days. And then also many different sports, you know, at least three, usually plus some strength training in there as well. So you're really, when you think about healthful pursuits, you know, and certainly Ironman's getting, again, more towards that elite side, um, but certainly short distance triathlon, or at least training like a triathlete is, is a pretty neat way to approach a consummate athlete lifestyle, especially when it includes some strength training in, in there as well. Yeah, I think so, you're so right. So that's my, that's my tweet. If you can summarize that, that'd be great. Yeah, yikes. I'm a, I'm an endurance writer, not so much like a track <laughs> writer. So this is going to be right. tough for me too. Um, but yeah, I think that's exactly right. I think triathlon's awesome because it's possible to be pretty elite and pretty like serious about triathlon but stay like physically balanced I guess like you know cycling can be a little rough on the body as far as you know you have a cyclist who has been racing as a pro for 20 years and you know that's where you see like that hunched back and like you know a lot of upper body kind of missing from the equation um whereas triathlon you do tackle kind of everything you get like the pounding from the running so you're avoiding the osteoporosis issues and you know I think it's a really good all-around discipline when it comes to you want to be a serious racer but you also want to be a more consummate athlete because it lets you kind of hit both of those yeah I mean it just the reality is you know there's only so much time in a week so it's the same stuff we've talked about a ton in terms of being time limited but all all of a sudden you're not doing it all seated on a bicycle seat mm -hmm. you know with pre pressure on the same tissue and you know your knees and your hips absorbing basically all those repetitions um, you know now now it's that time just inevitably has to get spread right yeah between between at least three sports and then again if you start incorporating strength training or, or some other sport even, you know, just because it's convenient, you know, maybe you're going and doing ultimate Frisbee or something just because it fits with, you know, your social life or something yeah. too, right? It just very quickly becomes a really nice, uh, you know, almost made for you sort of training health plan. Yeah. And I mean, I think I'll say all the cyclists that are thinking about just skipping this podcast, I really do think there's a ton of value in here for cyclists and maybe it'll kind of prompt you to do a little bit of you know, stuff outside of cycling. I know for me, I hadn't been swimming in, you know, quite a while. We went about a month ago uh, once, but then I went again on Monday and I was actually super sore from yoga, which is a story for another day. Um, and I kind of remembered how much I enjoy swimming um, and how good it feels as far as a low impact exercise. So I think, you know, as a cyclist who's, you know, injured or dealing with just some like lingering pain from a ride or your muscles are super tight like getting in the pool is you know one of the best workouts you can do for kind of making your body just feel a lot better and it's something I think a lot of cyclists wouldn't even contemplate yeah it's I mean having been there you know over a year ago but we'll call it a year ago it's it's really intimidating to do because you feel like a complete noob like you, you get in there and you're floundering around and you don't know what to do and yeah, but it's 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 good. Like I'm very glad I have that ability now, and you know, hopefully down the road here, my original objective was to be able to go to the beach and not, you know, be grumpy. And and so I think we're closer to that. I still don't really like the beach that much, but um, you know, be able to get into the ocean and go for a swim and not be terrified. I'm going to get swept out to the ocean, or you know, to even better go surfing or. I secretly want to like go float down rivers and stuff so i hear you more to... more beach time this summer perfect <laughs> done sold yeah i mean it just it's a good skill but yeah to your point you know being able to float you know get some compression from water get your arms over your head um you know just sort of that alignment and awareness of your body you have to have in the water is going to be again transfer over to other sports and and, and or just balance out from other sports i think quite nicely exactly all right, we've talked enough. Let's dive in. Enjoy this chat with Nicole. I want to hear your like 30 second bio. I mean, I know obviously it's going to take a lot longer, but what's like <laughs> the quick hit if you're talking in an elevator to someone? Who are you? Okay. 
I am Nicole Lower. I am a 24-year-old triathlete based in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. Um, uh, during my nine to five, I'm the global digital editor at Christian Louboutin, and I'm also an adjunct professor at New York University. Okay, I love both of those things. Uh, so first of all, what does global digital editor entail? <laughs> um, so anything that touches the internet, I sort of have a touch point on and it's sort of final approval just to make sure that it's in line with brand codes. Um, it's a pretty interesting role. That's awesome. And what do you teach at NYU? Um, this semester I'm teaching digital marketing, but traditionally in the past it's been social media um, management and optimization. That's awesome. Those classes did not exist when I was in school a few years ago. So I feel like that's very different now. <laughs> Yeah, they didn't exist when I was in college either, um, and I actually, the year after I graduated from the Fashion Institute of Technology, uh, New York University actually brought me in to write their first social media course. Oh, so, cool. Yeah, so it's something I'm like super passionate about um, outside of doing triathlons. That's awesome. Um, okay, so were you an athletic kid? How did the triathlon thing happen? God, no, not at all. Um, <laughs> you and me both. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, the people that are most like competitive have no backgrounds, I feel like. Um, no, so I always love to tell people that when I was in high school, actually, I would come home from school and sleep on my couch from 3 to 5.55, which was five minutes before my mom walked in the door, because if she saw me sleeping on the couch, which I did every single day, she would like smack me across the face. <laughs> and. That's like no joke at all. I, I hated running. I would find any way to get out of gym class literally from the time I was in first grade. Um, yeah, and I mean, I think, you know, I really found my roots in running when I was probably, I think, 14 or 15. We had a, My dad had a treadmill in our um, in our basement, and he was like, I bet you can't even run one mile without stopping. So I literally spent my entire summer that summer like perfecting my mile and like by the <laughs> I had, like I think I had a 10 minute mile or like maybe an 11 minute mile it felt very like abysmal for like a five foot three like preteen teenager um but I mean I did it so that was like it gave me a, a lot of strength and I felt very empowered as like a preteen that I could actually run a mile especially given that like all my time up to that was like not at all and also I guess I should note that my mom was um, an Olympic diver, so Whoa. my jeans to be like athletic, I just was not at all. Yeah, I hear that. I remember pretending to throw up to avoid running the mile in gym. Yep. yep. <laughs> was there too. That first mile is always amazing when suddenly you realize like, holy crap, I actually ran for a whole mile. Yeah, it's wild. Um, and I, I find, I don't know if you find, but I also, I find that I feel the same way about it, whether it's like lifting weights now or it's biking or anything. Anytime I hit a new goal that I strive for myself, I'm like, wow, I just did that. Yeah, absolutely. And so you talked a couple, you talked in a couple articles that I read about how going to spin class in college really helped with like social anxiety. Can you talk about that a bit? Yeah, for sure. Um, it's something, you know, growing up, and I still think there's a lot of, I mean, in New York, not so much, but I still think there's a lot of um, stigma around, like, how people feel about talking about anxiety. Um, and it was really important for me to bring that to light, which is how that article came along. Um, but I, I found, you know, spinning very haphazardly just through a friend's invite. Um, and it's sort of, you know, with athleticism and whether it's you're doing something by yourself or with a group of people, you know, it really does, it comes down to just doing what you love, I think, whether it's competitive or not. Um, and you're surrounded with people doing the things they love, where in my experience within like my own personal industry of fashion, people don't necessarily love what they do. And, you know, it's not really like that great of an environment. Um, so, <laughs> so it's like, it was always nice, I guess, you know, going to school for fashion and then working in fashion, but more so when I was in college, always having this, like, 45 minutes out of my week that I could really just, like, dedicate to myself and pushing myself what felt like and I believe was in a better place. I love that. 
And so how did how did spinning morph and running morph into triathlon, especially in New York? Because New York is not like the most tri friendly of places to be training. At all. I- <laughs> All the time. Like, it is the worst sport to get into in New York City. There are, like, no pools available. Biking, you have to, like, bike to get out of the city. Um, I actually had a random friend after I graduated from college who was, like, he was he was the only triathlete I had ever met. And I'd never even known what a triathlon was up until that point. Um, so I was fresh out of college. And I had started my first job at NARS Cosmetics. Um and they actually had a team called Team NARS that competed in the Lava Man Triathlon, which is the biggest triathlon in the world and the most competitive in the world. It's um, highly, highly coveted. And I was like, I think I can do this. And all everyone that like had done it before was like, you're already spinning like five times a week. You love to run. Like all you have to do is learn to swim. I could not swim at all. So- <laughs> Well, like, did not float in water. And they were like, you can very much do this. It's super easy. So I signed up for it. I had four months to train. And luckily, um, my team actually provided everyone with a coach. So I was like, you know what? Fuck it. I'm just going to try it. And I did it. And I placed in my first triathlon. So at the end of like the four months and after I placed, my coach was very much just like, I think you should consider doing this. Like this is something you're actually good at. Um, so I committed to it. But after that point, I realized like when you don't have a coach, like it does become much harder to do it. You know, it's like you don't have a team to lean back on. You have yourself only, um, unless you have a coach, which now I do, but previously in my first few seasons, I didn't. Um, And not only that, like I was saying earlier, it's like people also don't realize that, like, I traveled to, like, Harlem from, like, Williamsburg, Brooklyn to go swimming. It's, like, it's an hour there just to spend, like, 40 minutes to an hour and a half, like, doing technique swims in a pool. And likewise with, um, you know, spinning and cycling outside. It's just, like, you – I have to bike, like, 45 minutes just to get out of the city just so I can get a consistent cadence. And it's, like, it's it's definitely an investment of, like, time in yourself. So, like – when I label myself as a triathlete, it's not so much like because I do triathlons. It's like pretty much an entire lifestyle change that I feel like I've kind of come up against. Yeah. Actually, so I had a question about that that I was going to ask later, but I'm going to ask now. Um, do you, would you say you, you race to train or train to race? Because I feel like for me, I definitely race in order to train. So like I sign up for stuff to make myself train and like I love the training like that's actually more what I enjoy than anything else yeah I um you know there's nothing I love that question I think there's nothing more rewarding for me in my entire life that I've ever done besides cross the finish line of triathlons which is why I keep doing them but I really really do think I race to train yes you know it's like I I feel this sense of fulfillment yes when I cross the finish line of a triathlon but also like what am I doing next so it's like well, I know I can do a triathlon. It's like, okay, so I'm going to use like the next six triathlons to train for an Ironman. So it's, yeah. So I think I definitely do that. Yeah. Um, speaking of which, did I see you're going for a longer course plan this summer? Yes, I was going to do a half Ironman, which still, given like how much the volume of training that I'm doing now, I still feel like I could do. Um, I kind of put training and well, I guess I should say, um, more so racing on the back burner. Cause I am still training at the same volume. I put racing on the back burner, um, for the next year, just to focus on like being engaged and like trying to enjoy that as much as possible. Um, and also I'm at a point too, where I really am trying to balance, um, like my mental health and wellness, um, my job, my day, like my nine to five is very stressful and that pays the bills more than being a triathlete does just in full transparency. So I have to focus on that and my mental well-being, and then, you know, triathlons come after that. Um, so I likely will still be racing this summer. Not sure how I'll place, but I'm optimistic about it. So we'll see. 
Well, the nice thing about the half Iron Man is, I mean, and the Iron Man is like, it's kind of about completion versus time, especially at first, right? So it kind of is less stressful in some ways. Like, yeah, for sure. Um, we'll see. I mean, it's it's one of those things where it's like, I'm very determined to do it. And again, like being a triathlete is like very much my lifestyle. So it's like, if it's not this summer, then it'll be next summer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I found, I feel like it's weird, but I actually kind of used Iron Man as an excuse to slow down for me. <laughs> for me. <laughs> it sounds so dumb, but like, I actually was terrified of having to go fast in like a 5k or a regular, like regular course triathlon. So I like shifted from short course to long course for the excuse of like, I just like finishing is, you know, most of the battle there. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, it's just straight up to finish. Exactly. Okay, favorite workout and least favorite workout. Man, um, favorite workout. I I mean I love to lift weights. Like I feel I always such I think, a bad triathlete. <laughs> like it's not even in the triathlete code. I know. Like I'm pretty sure all of my coach friends are like you're the most oddball because most triathletes hate lifting weights. Um, but in the in the I guess in when looking at triathlons, I think my favorite is probably the run. I think it's like super, super freeing. And also, I don't know if I'm the only one that feels like so much anxiety when I'm on a bike and racing. I'm like, my tires could pop. Someone could be an asshole and come up next to me. Like, there are just so many things. Mm -hmm. Um, Also, something that a lot of people don't know about me, and I guess this is the first time I'm actually sharing this, I have no peripheral vision whatsoever. Yeah. So for me, like... Like, it's just very, ner- like, I I have anxiety for the full, like, 60 minutes that I'm on that bike on a course, um, especially if it's on an open road, which I experience quite a bit. Um, and there's not, I don't have a spotter. So, like, when I'm training outside, I typically have a spotter. And I just don't have that in race, obviously. Oh, my uh, gosh. What about getting, like, mirrors for your helmet? <laughs> oh, God, yes. I've thought about that, but I'm, like... It's this is so stupid, but I'm like, how much will that slow me down? <laughs> not arrow, not arrow at all. <laughs> um, and then my swim coach. I'm sorry, Morgan. I don't like swimming. I'm so. It's the shortest and like quite frankly the easiest part, but I just don't like it. I don't know why. I just don't like. It. <laughs> Okay, I have to go back to your first race. You had just learned to swim and figured that out like four months out. Yes. How was I, that? I know, I know. So this is this is hilarious, but Sarah, my fiance, loves to tell this story to people. Like literally two months before I started training, we went to Aruba and I had a life vest on and I pretty much was drowning in the life vest. Like someone had to come save me. So you can imagine when he was on the sideline of my first triathlon in Hawaii, in open water, like with potential sharks or whatever, he, I think he was freaked out more than I was because he was like, this girl cannot fucking swim. He had never seen me swim again up to that point. Um, I mean, it really, this goes back to like, you know, completing your first mile or any sort of milestone, I think when it comes to athleticism, it's like. I spent so much time in the pool, like just to learn the basics of like not freaking out when you're underwater and like how to actually stay afloat. And, um, I mean, it's, it, it really came down, I think when I was competing down to mind over matter and just getting myself into a mindset of you can do this. And I, I honestly think that when you are a triathlete, there is this level of like, Obviously, you have to be, like, fit in some capacity and, like, you have trained. But I think that a lot of it is very much mental. And that's a huge challenge that I like out of it. Yeah. It's so funny how hard swimming is when you're not super proficient at it. I remember my husband, who's a, like, pro cyclist. Like, we were doing Ironman last summer, and he decided to learn how to swim for it. Oh, Um, my gosh. Yeah, he's an idiot. (laughs) (laughs) But we got out of the pool the first time, and he was just like, that was the hardest thing I've ever done. It is it is so hard and so stressful when you're not used to it. So how was the open water part? So you probably, I assume you learned in a pool versus uh, the Hudson River 
Yeah, I've only swim swam in the Hudson River once. Um, I will only ever do it if it's for a race again. But swimming in open water, I mean, there's a difference between swimming in like Hawaii open water versus the Hudson open water. And I had never done any open water swims up to that point. I actually ended up going to Hawaii a few days earlier just to practice for like 20 minute interval intervals being in open water. Cause my only experience prior to that was like almost drowning in Aruba and that's <laughs> kind of like traumatizing. Um, so obviously it was quite a transition, but it ended up being like, the lovely like I don't even know why it was so lovely I don't know why I'm saying that swimming in a triathlon was like a lovely experience but it really was like the water was super clear I could feel the sun on my back it was just like it was it was a really magical experience you could see the fish all around you and um nothing like swimming in the Hudson River I was just gonna say like having was it the New York uh the like New York triathlon yeah it was the New York City triathlon which was my dream race. Like in my mind, I was like, yes, favorite city. I get to do my favorite triathlon ever. And that was, that was a grueling experience. That was pretty much what the equivalent of like how people envision New York treating you. It's like getting beat over the head. Exactly. Yeah. I remember like, yeah, diving off the platform, not being able to see my hand in front of me, getting kicked in the face, like grabbed by the ankle, like dragged back. Yeah, I mean, for New York specifically, I it's like it's the people here are very competitive and like it's a very competitive race. And unfortunately, because I was in so I'm oh, I've always competed in the youngest age groups, um, which is great. But you're also last. And unfortunately, um, for my when my session jumped into the water, there was a boat that went by <laughs> and it happened to be, which is totally illegal. Like that person, I'm sure either got like fined some ridiculous amount of money. But I actually, for some reason, was an idiot and decided I wanted to be close to the pier, which I don't know why, but also the, that pier is concrete cement. Um, and so when the boat came by, I was actually pushed into yeah, it was into the concrete. It was pretty horrific. I actually stopped um, half. I remember it was the halfway mark from the swim. This is like the most traumatizing thing. I stopped at the halfway mark on a surfboard because they have lifeguards out there. Mm-hmm. And I considered quitting yeah. at that point. And in my head, I was like, this ain't what a New Yorker does. So I was like, I'm just going to keep going. And I looked at the lifeguard. I was like, how much longer do I have to go? And he's like, you have halfway. And I was like, you know what? That'll take me like four minutes. I can do that. So. Oh, my God. Yeah. I remember that being one of the gnarliest swims I've ever done. That was disgusting. And then even when you get out, did they like spray you guys with like the antibacterial water? <laughs> Wait. So no one explains this to you. You aren't allowed to step down when you get to the end of the swim. People help, like I had two people help pull me out. And the dudes who helped pull me out actually said to me, wipe your face, there are cameras, and you have the grossest Hudson stash we've ever seen. And wait, it gets gets better. So I wipe my face. Photos are taken of me, of me wiping my face. They're pretty epic. But when I'm crossing the finish line at the end of the race, I still had black shit all over my face. I went entire race with the Hudson on my face. It was disgusting. Oh, brutal. (laughs) That was like one, I think I did that my second year of racing, and I just remember all the pictures of me. I didn't realize how old my bathing suit that I was racing in had gotten. So all of them are like, the top is just like so sagged down. I had to like delete all of them. I'm like, please remove these. These are inappropriate. <laughs> so. so funny. I wore my tri suit backwards that morning. So yeah, it was. Was it one of the ones that's supposed to zip in the back that makes no sense? Yeah, and the zip only went half, like, literally to my bust. And I remember I ran into my first triathlon coach during before that race, and he literally looked at me as I was in line, like, five seconds out from jumping into the water. And he goes, hey, you might want to email me about your tri suit after this. So I emailed him, and he was like, that was totally on backwards. Oh, my God. That is amazing. But also, worst triathlon design ever, by the way, is having that zipper on the back. Like, then you have to ask someone to, like, zip it up and down for you when you're hitting the pre-race porta potty (laughs) I know. It's pretty, like, I just don't. I don't. (laughs) Um, Okay, so I'm going to go back to strength training. How did you get into it? Are you just one of those, like, people who's naturally, like, good at strength training and so it's fun? Or... 
No, not at all. Again, like back to back to athleticism. I actually went through um, after my first triad. The, the re- this is so crazy. The reason I got into strength training is after my first triathlon. Um, to my, so I'm five seven, which a lot of people are like, "Holy shit, you're really tall. You look very short on the internet." Um, Thanks. <laughs> I get that a lot. It's really bizarre. Um, I, so I'm five seven. And, like, typically my build, like, is anywhere between 130 and 140 pounds, which is, like, very, very healthy. Um, so when, after my first triathlon, I had continued to train just because I wasn't sure if that summer I wanted to do another triathlon. Um, and this was without strength training. I ended up dropping down to 113 pounds, which I actually didn't know because my apartment at the time, I was living like as like a single girl in New York or, you know, like by myself. Um, I didn't have a full length mirror in, anywhere in my apartment. So the amount of times that I actually encountered a full length mirror were like never. And the mirror that I had was like shoulders and up. Um, and so like, I kind of just like dwindled away, like very, very slowly. And like, I mean, obviously I was like, my clothes are a little bit too big, but like, it's totally fine. Um, and then I went home to see my family and they were like, you're like very, like, there's something wrong with you. Like you should like, we need to like go see a doctor or something. So like I went on this like super aggressive plan, which I kind of have documented, um, on Instagram. I went through this super progressive plan with like a few doctors and nutritionists where like, I pretty much did like all of this backwards, like nutritioning just to like, I was eating at like my height of it, I was eating like over a pound of peanut butter straight from the jar right before I went to bed every night just to get my like weight back up. Um, and then on top of that, I was also strength training because I, I mean, obviously it's like when you lose that much weight that quickly, it was, I lost that much weight in like three months. And it's like, of course I did because I was doing cardio for two to three hours a day. Um, and while I was like, obviously super fast and whatnot, and my energy levels weren't down, like, like, internally like I I know like looking back on it like I was not healthy and you know so that's kind of where strength training came into play and I think it was like super super magical at the end of it and um I think all women should strength train in some capacity whether it's like you're doing hit with like weights or you're doing bar class with weights or you know it doesn't have to be like for me it's like I love lifting really really heavy but I don't that's not for everyone and I like I just think that everyone should lift weights I think it's so good for everything. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I love, by the way, that you actually like hit that weight and were like, oh, okay, this is a problem versus I think a lot of people would have gone home and had their family be like, oh, you're looking really thin and be like, thanks. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Not, I mean, it's one of those things where it's like, especially in New York, it's so hard because you're like, and as a woman, especially like you're like, you push these like super weird, like you have to be skinny, you have to have long hair, you have to, you know what I mean? All of these like stereotypes. And I honestly think, you know, embracing triathlons and like that part of me helped push back on this as well. It's very much like, no, I set my own standard for beauty. And you know, whether I'm 116 pounds, 130 pounds, or even if I decided one day, you know what, fuck triathlons and just ate ice cream for every meal and was 180 pounds, fuck it. You know what I mean? It's my own standard of beauty. And I'm not going to let anyone tell me what that is. Yeah. No, I love that. Okay. Favorite couple of strength training moves. Like what are your favorite lifts? Girl loves a leg day. Girl loves a leg day. Um, I love squats a lot and I love, um, deadlifts, sumo deadlifts. Um, and this morning I hit my, what is it? Like my, like, personal record my PR I guess you would call it for like um a leg press and I can like press 300 pounds nice yeah that's awesome I uh so I Irish step danced in my youth so I was on my toes like 10 hours a week Um, that's amazing so lame like that was my only athletic endeavor but I love the weight room in high school because when you're on your toes that much your legs are wicked strong yeah so I remember being able to leg press like yeah, 300 or 350 or something when I was, like, 16, which was more than, like, the dudes on the football team were doing. <laughs> I know. Isn't that amazing when you're, like, next to a guy and you're, like, uh, I don't know if I should be proud of this or not. Yeah. The coach actually had me come in after school and do that in front of the football team. Oh my God, put them to shame. Yeah. Which, I mean, it was super great for my, like, my ego and 
feminine feelings in high school. Did a lot. Yeah. (laughs) But otherwise it was super cool. So nice job on the PR. Love Um, that. Okay. So that actually, the fact that it's 930 when we're talking about this brings me to the obvious, your 430 AM workouts. What the hell? Yeah. Um, so I, I don't even know where to start with this. I have always really been an early riser and by early, I mean, I started, I guess when I started incorporating my workouts in, I was like a a. 6am-er. So I'd be at the gym by 6am, which to me now I'm like, yeah, that's, that's like very normal and like very commendable. Um, I moved to a different neighborhood in which my gym now is like two blocks from my apartment and it opens at 5.30. So there's another part of my training that I don't really talk about that much, but I do do double days every single day. Um, So I do strength training in the morning and then I go back and do cardio in the evening. Uh, Yeah. So, or if it's on the weekend, I'll do, you know, cardio in the morning and the strength training in the evening just because it's more pleasant. Um, and I found just that at 4.30 AM, like in New York and in my neighborhood, there's like no one, like it, it's just like the most magical time to be awake. And like, I, for me and like my heart of hearts, I'm like such a like homebody and I love to be by myself. So like, that's like the one thing that I look forward to is like, even if I'm like dead ass tired, I'll still wake up and like go to the gym. Um, the other thing that people don't realize about my amazing parents is that they were farmers. And when you're a farmer, you wake up at like the ass crack of dawn. Um, and I mean, I guess when I was in college, another thing that a lot of people don't know about me is I was a barista. So I was at my coffee shop by 3.30 most mornings. And then I would go to school after that. So I pretty much replaced like my work with like training in the morning. Okay. That actually makes sense. Do you go to bed wicked early then? Yeah, I'm like a 9 p.m., 9.30. And like notoriously, if I'm out on the weekends, you will find me asleep at a bar. Like, I've I've fallen asleep at the premiere of Star Wars, like in the street <laughs> of the theater, with like said respectfully, the nerdiest people around me being like, "What the fuck is this girl doing?" <laughs> Understandable. I yeah, I've definitely fallen asleep like at shows, like shows that I wanted to go to, just like in the corner, like with a coat, just sort of just, tucked up. Yeah. Like, I'm just resting my eyes for three hours. Yeah. Yeah, just just like a quick nap. <laughs> okay, this leads me to two questions. Number one, how how did you, how is this possible with your fiancé? Like, does he not get pissed that you're up at 4.30 in the morning? Oh, my God, this morning was rough. This morning was rough. So he's, um, we are on completely opposite schedules. Like, he is very much like he goes to bed when I'm waking up. Um, he's a creative, like diehard creative. He gets the way I feel about 4.30 a.m. He feels about like 3.30 in the morning. So, I mean, we're on complete opposite schedules. Um, in his effort to go to bed early, it kind of like clashes with the fact that my alarm is at 4.30 in the morning. So... Yes, he does get pissy now. Previously, we would kind of be like passing ships in the night and we'd I'd say good morning and he'd say good night and I would go to the gym and he would go to bed and it just kind of worked out like that. Um yeah. <laughs> I like that. My my husband's kind of an early like a 6 a.m. guy and I think that's actually like less good for me because I'm like I want to be the one like up first and like doing my like I like the idea of like by yourself yeah having that time alone so it's kind of a constant like battle to see who can get up first but you only get like 10 minutes you know what those 10 minutes are victorious though yeah exactly I feel really smug about it (laughs) the downside is like right now it's so freaking cold out that like we don't have a gym right near us I'd have to run or ride to it or something and it's you know negative something we're in Canada it's really cold here yeah, that's horrific. Yeah, I'm I'm much more used to. I grew up in New Jersey, so I'm used to the New Jersey like pretty mild temperatures. Yeah, versus completely different. Yeah. Okay. Wait. So, if your parents are from a farm, where did you grow up? 
I grew up on a farm as well. Um, so I'm from a farm town outside of Baltimore, Maryland. Um, okay. It's Westminster. It's pretty tiny. Um, and yeah, I love it. My parents have a really beautiful farm now that they just moved to. Um, and it's amazing. Like, I think that, you know, having parents that are like blue collar as mine are and like moving to a city like this, it just gives you such a different work ethic, which I think why like working up at or waking up at 430 and then going directly to work like isn't really a thing for me. It's just always been how do you pay the bills? And um, I guess that's like probably not like the best way. Like I constantly feel like I'm in like fight or flight mode. Like, am I going to be able to pay my rent this month? Which always yes. Um, but it's one of those things where it's like, yeah, it's like you got to work to put food on the table. Mm -hmm. Um, and I actually really like you've written about making exercise a priority. Um, and I mean, we're talking now about putting food on the table and paying rent and stuff, but exercise still factors into that as like this number one thing. Can you kind of speak to that a bit? Yeah, I think that it more so stands for um, a level of respect that I have for myself. So, you know, by putting that in the forefront of like most places that I go to work or with any of my clients, um, it gives this level of like, I respect myself and you need to respect my time and me. Um, and I'm going to do X amount of work for you and I'm not going to work like a dog for you because this is life mm -hmm. and 2018 and like well being is very important in 2018. I mean, we're up against like some of the craziest shit in, in America. Like I honestly like wake up every day and I'm like, I'm, I'm surprised that we're even a functioning country. I mean, this goes above and beyond, but it's one of those things that's like, you have to be able to find um, time for yourself that you can carve out and make your own. And you have to be really willing to not compromise on that. I mean, that said, like, obviously if like, I can't eat food, then obviously I'm not working out, but it's like, and I'm going to go work so I can make money. But, um, yeah, I just think that, you know, it sets a precedent for how you look at yourself and how other people look at you. I love that. Um, yeah. And I think so many people kind of miss that because the amount of people I know that, yeah, like kind of like working out or, you know, want to, but then they're like, oh, well, I just have too much work or, you know, just can't prioritize it. Yeah. And it's one of those things where it's like, you can make excuses all day and all day and all day. It's like, find the reason why you can't, like, you. it's, I don't know. I just, I was there at one point, but I have this saying that I love, commit to the version of yourself that you want to be. Um, and you know, you're not going to be making steps in the right direction if you're not setting those boundaries. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay. Also the hip shake at four 30 in the morning. Yes. You have to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, that came about as just a joke. Like I did it randomly a little over a year ago. Um, and then this like sh this inspiration kind of hit me where I have this friend who um, has a museum that is crowdsourced once a year by people just donating pieces. Um, and it's called, I believe it's the Sexi Sexting AF um, Museum. So it's here in New York City and people crowdsource, uh, or he crowdsources, um, you know, people just to contribute to this exhibition that are like, either like people that get sent nudes, so like unsolicited DMs, and it's like they go for auction. It's actually like very successful, but they go for auction and all of the proceeds benefit Planned Parenthood. Um, so what I decided to do was a two-pronged approach to this hip shape thing, and the first part is that I'm actually going to auction off my um, entire year compilation of hip shakes um, to some creep, and that money is going to go to Planned Parenthood. And then also um, the second approach is just that, you know, with all the writing that I've been doing and freelancing on the side is um, I really want to show people that like, like that skinny to strong transformation. And like, for me, that's been like, you don't know it because it's 2D and like, it's just like a very quick, like four seconds in the morning. But it's like, if you really do look at like the first one that I did where I was 115 pounds versus the one that I do now where I'm 145 pounds, it's like, it's pretty magical to see that like, 
it's okay to gain weight and like you can still be strong and like you can still be powerful. So I want to use that as like part of like a almost like a writing piece or something that's coming up. Oh, I really love that. That's awesome. Um, yeah. I also think it's it's just nice because like I don't know when I saw it, I was like, oh, like that actually seems like a kind of fun way to like set yourself up for the workout and yeah. just like get yourself into like the yeah, it's four thirty in the morning, but like everything's good. <laughs> Yeah, and, like, people don't realize that, like, at that time in the morning, like, when I'm doing that, I'm actually listening to, like, EDM music. Like, <laughs> I'm, like, dancing around my apartment, very much in line with, like, my fiancé fucking hates me. <laughs> He'll get used to it or get really good earplugs or something. We'll figure it out. We'll figure yeah. it out. Um, okay, so one of the articles that I had read with you was – again, 2016, and it was on HB Fit, and it was talking about food. And what I loved was that you actually said, I eat 24 to 2,700 calories a day, which you never hear from women. So many of, like, the meal plans and, like, shape and, like, oxygen and whatever are, like, 1,200 calories for your day. And it makes me crazy. So I love that you were actually, like, capable of, like, talking about that and saying, like, yeah, we actually need this much. Yeah, I think it's, like, pretty much a responsibility for me at this point with, like, the following that I have. It's, like, when I remember one time, love, I think the Kardashians are such a spectacle. Love them. Love everything that they do. Like, I'm very, like, I'm just amused by them. But I remember hearing once that in, when Khloe Kardashian went on her, like, revenge diet or whatever it was called, she was eating 1,200 calories a day. And I think, I honestly think that when women tout that to other women or, you know, any sort of professional touts that sort of mentality into the general public. I think that that is so irresponsible. I think we have so many eating disorders and so many girls with self-esteem issues. It's at an all-time high. And it's like, why contribute to that? Like, that is, that's not okay. So for, it, I mean, I don't feel like I come across many articles like mine that, you know, openly say, like, I eat this many calories and like, it's like that again is non-negotiable. It's like, I need that to sustain. And it's like, I've had scientific tests done. And it's like, even for someone of like my size or beyond, like 1200 calories is just not enough. Like it's just, it's just not enough. And it makes me really sad that, you know, women especially think that, you know, they need to go on these crash diets to like, to like be a certain way to fulfill like some sort of vision that they have. And like, you just don't, it's just not worth it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I have to say like your, what you ate in that day looked awesome. Um, but you're like pretty crazy busy. How do you manage to make all of these good looking foods and they yeah. <laughs> look like that? Um, <laughs> I'm a fan of like just throwing shit into a bowl. Um, mm -hmm. but more importantly, you know, um, on Sundays is like my meal prep day. I'm very like. I spend like maybe two hours maximum doing meal prep on a Sunday and that sets me up for the whole week. So, I mean, that's a lot more efficient to me than like every single day waking up and be feeling like frantic of like, what am I going to eat today? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's where that comes in. I love that. So what is, what does like a typical day look like for you meal wise? Um, so I will either have a smoothie in the morning with banana protein powder and almond milk, um, or I'll have eggs, sweet potatoes, um, greens, and avocado. You and um, I eat the exact same breakfast. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. It's like, it's just such a good way to like, it's like my go-to sweet or my go-to savory. It's such a good way to like start the day. Mm -hmm. Um, I should also say that I do this thing where I'm pretty sure this is an Aries thing where I eat the same meals for literally two months straight until I can't eat them anymore just because it's like I'm so habitual about things. Mm -hmm. So like for lunch, I have a taco salad. So it's, you know, romaine, um, a red cabbage mix, either grilled chicken or grilled salmon. I'm on like a weird salmon kick. Um, <laughs> roasted peppers, um, salsa, salt, pepper, and then um, guacamole. Nice. And then I also, I mean, I have a few snacks throughout the day. So like peanut butter and apple, um, Greek yogurt with either like PB2 and stevia or um, regular peanut butter or um, protein powder mixed in. And then um, 
I'm like weirdly a fan of quest bars for some reason. They're so artificial and like I'm very much trying to eat as like quote clean as possible these days. Um, but yeah. And then for dinner, it's like chicken and veggies. I try to wane off of like carbs at night. Um, I know that it doesn't really matter. Honestly, it doesn't really matter to bodies and they kind of like take food in 24 hour cycles. But um, for me, it's just I find that my body reacts better. And then every single night I have protein ice cream before I go to bed, like literally 30 minutes before I go to bed. So that's where I end everything. It's a lot of food. I like it. Okay. What is the protein ice cream? Yes, this is like my favorite thing in the world. It's um, so I'm I have been doing like no sugar um and it's kind of like my way around it so it's a like no sugar mint chocolate chip protein powder um with almond milk ice what else do i throw on there stevia and i think that's everything and i and spinach i put spinach in it and it's freaking delicious and it's like a bowl of like protein ice cream and i just eat it every night that sounds amazing yeah Oh, man, I love it. Also, I'm with you on the uh, throw things in a bowl. I realize the big mistake people make is they don't shake the bowl. Right. Right. That, that's a huge, like, I just, I mean, I just learned that. It's the same way that I literally didn't use salt until, like, two years ago. And that is, like, a game changer. Yeah, 100%. Okay. Um, advice for new triathletes or people who are tri curious, what do you wish someone had told you? Um, uh, I wish that someone would have taught me the importance of rest. Um, and I also wish someone would have explained to me periodization with training. So, I mean, being fast and being good at what you do or even just completing, you know, people think that doing more and more and more is always the answer. But when you're doing multi-level sports and when you have to train at a volume of like 10 hours or more a week, um, you absolutely need like two days of rest, like not like haphazard, like I'll rest in the evening and then in the morning. No, you need like full days of like, just like chilling. Cause like, I mean, everything from, like, your muscles to, like, your cortisol levels, which elevate your stress or de-elevate it. I mean, it's, like, you need to keep that in check. Otherwise, like, everything is going to be out of balance. You're not going to be able to sleep. Your hormones are going to be imbalanced, and you're not going to be eating right. And it just um, – it's not good. And, like, I think triathletes more than most other athletes, like the normal triathlete, experiences overtraining, which is where you yeah. just train your body into, like – for those that don't know, train your body into, like – essentially you're just not able to perform. And that's something that I've actually come out against like three or four times in my triathlete career. Um, you know, your body gets into this overtrain mode and that's a really scary situation to be in. And then also the periodization, you know, it's like you feel like you have to do all of these things and accomplish all these things um, and all these activities, but the real goal there should be, you know, focus on one thing, get good at it, and then focus on the next one and get good at it, and then find a way to segment them all together. I know that a lot of my training in the beginning was spent, you know, swimming, biking, running, like, like every single day, like, doing, essentially doing mini triathlons, or, like, <laughs> and you don't have to do that to be good at it, like, you don't even have to do it to complete it, like, it's just, you know, just focus on, like, your weaknesses, and um, you will get better, and trust in the process, too, I mean, I think that's a being a triathlete doesn't, you don't wake up and you're like, I'm a triathlete. It just doesn't happen like that. Mm -hmm. It's like many seasons and, you know, many months of just like putting yourself to it. Yeah. I love that. And I've seen, you've written a bunch about, you know, recovery stuff and actually taking the time to do not just recovering, taking time off, but like recovering, like doing the rolling and the stretching and all that fun stuff. Yeah, I'm so bad at that. Like, and I think that's why I preach it so hard is like, if I say it enough, like I'll do it too. And it's true. Like, like, um, now I'm doing warm ups before I work out, which is not something I've ever done. I'm doing cool downs, which is not something I've ever done. Um, and you know, stretching, whether it's like going to a physical therapist or like doing five minutes before bed or, um, even sitting in the sauna, I think is like so good. It's just like, it's, it seems like a luxury at some point, but it's like, it's so necessary. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, I'm going to get made fun of by a lot of the masters who listen to this for asking this, but I'm going to ask anyway. How did you end up building such an awesome following on Instagram? Oh, um, so I actually was pretty big on Tumblr before this. 
Um, I had one of the fa first fashion tumblers that was recognized by Tumblr. Um, and, you know, I grew that following to like over 100,000. And I think a lot of my followers from there crossed over. Um, I also think that I, I think that I have like a strong, like personal voice and like consistent, like brand strategy that I put on. And I'm also like very authentic at the end of the day. Um, and I'm not ever one to put on a face, I guess. And I think, you know, that does hinder, like, I don't really foresee my following, like growing past what it is now. And I think that's because like, you know, I'm only willing to compromise myself as a brand for so much. It's like, I still have to have a level of like authenticity to myself and, you know, willing to help people. And that's, that's more important to me than like having like a million followers. Totally. Um, I also have to ask, how do you get such great pictures? <laughs> so, um, my fiance is actually, he's a creative director, went to school for film. So he actually takes, unless it's for a campaign, like for Adidas or something, um, he'll take all my photos. Ah, uh, this is, this is where I messed up. I married a cycling coach instead of a photographer. It's true what they say about the Instagram husband. He is an Instagram husband. Yeah. Peter's one of those, like, look in the other direction while taking pictures <laughs> because it's like embarrassing for him to do it. He's like, I need like my hood up. I yeah. can't have and see me I'm like man if you would just look at the camera this would take a lot less time <laughs> oh, don't you love me I just want a cute photo like how hard is this <laughs> okay that is that is good to know I, I might need to re rethink some things here <laughs> <laughs> and kind of on that same note though I mean you had a fashion tumbler first and it seems like you've been really good at intersecting the like fashion with fitness thing really well so any, yeah. any tips for sort of people looking for a bit of that athletic fashion inspiration? Oh, it is so much easier today than it was like literally even three years ago. Um, I mean, for me, it's so innate. Like I've loved, I went to a fashion high school. I love fashion. I like, I, I can like, I can't foresee myself parting with like that side of me ever. I just am so in love with it. And I mean, it's funny because I, you know, I wear like matching sets to the gym and people like have stopped me like total strangers that are like, I know you because you're the girl that like is fashion at the gym. <laughs> so I've even like used the term like gym goth before because like it's very much to me like, I don't know, it's just like part of who I am. But I mean, if you're trying to like, it's one knowing your style. So first that, but I think like, you know, there are a lot of accessible, affordable brands out there. So you can like, cause athletic wear goes so quickly. So it's really just finding like the styles and cuts that flatter you and then going from there and, you know, sticking with the brand that you like because athletic wear like varies so much from brand to brand. It's like, you could be an outdoor voices kind of girl. You can be an Adidas kind of girl. You can be a Nike kind of girl. You can shop at Bandier, which is like so extensive. It's so awesome and luxurious. And, um, yeah, I think it's just about like not being afraid to go into like a fitting room and trying things on. Mm -hmm. Also, I love the hashtag health goth. It is like one of my absolute favorite. <laughs> I love that so much. It's like, it makes me so happy that that's like a thing. <laughs> yeah. It, it makes me really like sad for my like early twenties self because when I got into like, I was, you know, super punk rock in high school and early college. And then I got into cycling and triathlon and totally lost that side because I mean, you know, six years ago, you couldn't really get a whole lot of, like, cool black, like, cycling stuff, especially not for women. Still, it is still so hard. Like, all my time, I'm, like, considering having, like, a suit made because, like, even last season, my tri suit was, like, neon pink in some areas. And, like, I'm just, like, I'm, like, I don't want neons. Like, it's, like, why does all of this spandex have to come in neon only? Rather? What is wrong with gray? <laughs> gray is a neutral, too. It's a yeah. color. Exactly. Yeah. So it's been really interesting the last couple of years to suddenly be able to like kind of come back to that and be like, oh, okay, right. I can actually intersect these two things. And it's not That's so awesome. Yeah. So I started in fashion journalism. I was writing at L Girl um, yes. way back in the day when that existed. <laughs> and then I got into cycling and totally lost that side. So it's been interesting to kind of come back to that. Yeah, my fiance is very much like, he's like, he loves to cycle, but he is like, he's like, I will not be fucking caught dead in like a neon suit. <laughs> I do not blame him. <laughs> um, and then, so that kind of brought me to the last thing I kind of wanted to touch on is, 
women in sport kind of get hit with this like really obnoxious stigma where on one hand we're supposed to look super good while we're doing everything but on the other hand we get shit on for wearing any makeup or trying to look good because then we're not being athletic enough so it kind of feels like you can't win (laughs) have you have you run into that or any any thoughts on that (laughs) i'm very much in the camp of like women doing whatever the fuck they want in 2018. Mm-hmm. Like, like, I, if you want to wear makeup to the gym, like, it's not my cup of tea. Just do it. Do what makes you feel good. Um, I have come up against it. And I mean, it's the same thing where, like, I was, like, shut down any dude, like, in response to my hip shakes. I think that it's just, like, I'm, like, fuck you. I don't need your approval on my body. Like I'm going to do this whether you're commenting or not. Mm -hmm. And I think it goes for like what you're wearing and who you are as a person. It's just like, just do you, you know what I mean? It's, it's one of those things where it's like, I don't have the time or energy and no one should have the time or energy to entertain that. So yeah, it's definitely mostly dudes that seem to have the problem with it. I've noticed. And that's the other thing. I'm just like, I'm not over here commenting on this on the shortness of your shorts. Like, get out of here. Yeah. <laughs> and I find this is like so frustrating. It's like I feel like a lot of times I get talked down to like some male athletes that like are just like they're like you're pretty, you don't perform well. And it's like I'll show you that I can fucking perform well. Look at my fucking track record. I place in every race. Yeah. <laughs> so frustrating. But that's another. I'm trying to. <laughs> stoicism here and that's not stoic at all so (laughs) oh man I love it okay last thing where can people find you on the interwebs these days on the interwebs I am only on Instagram these days at Nicole Lower L-O-H-E-R Hey guys, before you go, we just wanted to have one quick word from our sponsor, Health IQ Health IQ is a life insurance company that helps the consummate athlete like you Save money on your life insurance. To find out more, you can check out healthiq.com slash C-A-P-O-D. That's C-A-P-O-D for all the details and to take a free quiz. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Consummate Athlete Podcast. To check out all of the show notes for this show, go to consummateathlete.com. And to follow along with our various adventures on the social medias, you can check us out on Facebook at facebook.com slash consummateathlete or follow me, Molly Herford, at Molly J. Herford on Twitter and Instagram. And I'm at Peter Glassford on Twitter and Instagram. And if you could give us a huge favor and rate and review the podcast over on iTunes, that helps us bring on more guests, you know, get more episodes out and do more cool stuff. So we would be forever grateful. And if you're looking for coaching for endurance sport or just for health and wellness, uh, you can check out smartathlete.ca. And for amazing outdoor content, you can check out theoutdooredit.com. Aw, honey. And that's theoutdooredit.com for Molly Herford's writing and all things outdoors. All right. Thank you so much for listening, guys, and we'll see you next time.